Good morning, Hazelwood. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to service this morning. We are so glad that you're able to join us here in the sanctuary or online, and we hope that you're blessed by this service. We'd like to thank Becky Burkhart for playing organ for us this morning when um, Lori is out for the day. Hello. I love it. It is good to be with you all this morning. I thought I would start or invite us into the space of worship with a story about how the sanctuary of God was created in this space. Who knows, perhaps this very sanctuary in which we worship today. Time before time, when the world was young, two neighbors shared a field and a mill. Each night they divided evenly the grain they had ground together during the day. Now, as it happened, one of the neighbors lived alone. The other had a wife and a large family. One day, the neighbor who lived alone thought to himself, it isn't really fair that we divide the grain evenly. I have only myself to care for, but my neighbor has children to feed. So each night, he secretly took some of his grain over to his neighbor's grain elevator and put it there. But the married neighbor said to himself one day, it isn't really fair that we divide the grain evenly because I have children to provide for me in my old age, whereas my neighbor has no one. What will he do when he is old? So every night he secretly took some of his grain to his neighbor's granary. As a result, both of them always found their granaries restored in the morning. Then one night... The neighbors met each other, halfway between their two houses. They suddenly realized what had been happening and embraced each other in love. The story is that God witnessed their meeting and proclaimed, this place is holy, a place of love. And here it is that my sanctuary shall be built. And so it was. The holy place where God is made known is the place where human beings discover each other in love. Let us worship God in love together.
Will you please join us in the call to worship? You'll find the words in your bulletin as well as on the monitors, so those of us worshiping at home can also read. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the child, for the love which from our birth So what kind of week did you have this week? Was it filled with blessings and joy? Or did you have a week filled with stress, pain, or heartbreak? No matter what kind of week you've had, God is worthy of our praise. So let's give God all of our worship and praise as we stand and sing together. I invite you to stand as you will, and uh, the words of the songs will be on the screen. We have a leading section, so this side will lead with me, and then this side will echo with Wendy and Jared. You're worthy of my praise.
as we continue singing one of our beloved hymns, number 494, They'll Know We Are Christians. <clears throat> If we have any kids with us today, we're online, come on up. I don't think we do this morning. So first I wanted to share with you guys, we're going to be doing a trunk or treat on October 30th, and I'll be putting more out about that in the newsletter for this week. Uh, but let's get started. So what do you think is the greatest commandment in the entire Bible? When Jesus was asked to tell everyone what the greatest commandment was, he said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the other commandments and all of the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So what does it look like to love God and your neighbor with your whole heart? This is one of the questions I was going to ask the kids, but now it's up to you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure things. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot more of like our actions. We love people with our heart. What does it look like to love God with your whole mind? Mm -hmm. Prayer. Study. It's good. <laughs> awesome. And what does it look like to love God with your whole soul? Yeah, those are great. And it also says to love your neighbor. God says your neighbor is everyone. So I wanted to share a couple ways that you can show God's love to your neighbors. You can show God's love by listening. You can show God's love with generosity, by encouraging. You can show God's love with acts of kindness. You can show God's love by praying for others. And it's possible to show God's love to everyone. Let's pray. Glorious Father, as your dear children, we commit to loving you with all our hearts and with all our souls and with all our minds. This is the greatest and most important commandment of all. In the same spirit, we also commit to loving our neighbors as ourselves. We confess that the Holy Spirit fills and controls us 
as we commit to doing your will. We decree that we will be patient and kind instead of acting jealous, boastful, proud, or rude. We will not demand in our own way, but we will be considerate of others in their opinions. We will not be irritable or keep a record of being wronged, but we will be joyful and quick to forgive. We commit to living a righteous life. We will be patient and will not return evil with evil. We will let our light shine so that people will see our good works and glorify you, our Father. Amen. The author, teacher, and preacher, Brian McLaren, says of prayer, one way to define prayer is, prayer is the intentional strengthening of desire. Prayer is the intentional strengthening of desire. What might prayer look like if we asked to love more widely and more deeply and more clearly? To pray, to be able to see with God's eyes and desire to love all of creation with God's eyes. Please join me in our prayer hymn. This is from the Chalice Praise. <clears throat> excuse me, fall allergies. This is from the Chalice Praise hymnal, and it's called "Love the Lord Your God." Uh, you may not know this uh, little hymn, but uh, we're going to teach it to you. So we're going to sing it for you one time through, and then you'll be invited to join us. Love the Lord Your God. Let us continue in prayer. 
all-seeing and all-loving Creator God, grant us love. We desire to know and to see you more fully, to assume your loving ways and to make those ways more real in our own lives. We know that now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. We know our ways fall short, ignore the other, hide the truth, scream for attention, flail randomly about, demand certitude, and make us the center of our own worlds. Forgive us. We ask that the moment where we will see everything with perfect clarity come upon us when we encounter the other, the stranger, and our neighbor. Where we see gaps and love is lacking, move us to fill the empty space. Where we see cracks and love is absent, encourage us to bring our hearts. Where we see poverty and love is hiding, embolden us to give out of our abundance. Where we see hunger and love is deprived, inspire us to dream new ways of being. And where we see the absence of love, May love be all that we bring. Amen. Agape, one of several Greek words for love. Often seen as the highest form of love, it's known as self-sacrificing love for the sake of another. A love called out of one's heart by the very preciousness of what we see. Reflected in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Nazareth, this understanding of love was not absent from the understanding of the Jewish people in his time. Jesus simply reminded his people that their own scriptures depicted a loving God and that this loving God demanded that love be shown to others. Hear the word of God. Today's scripture reading comes to us from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, and it's entitled, The Great Commandment. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had left the Sadducees speechless, they met together. One of them, a legal expert, tested him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Love God love people. Sounds pretty easy, doesn't it? Sometimes it's not so easy, is it, my friends? That person that cut you off in traffic. That person who stands in front of you in the checkout line that says 20 items and they've got 25. Someone who does something unspeakable that we can't fathom. It's hard for us to love them, but you know who does? God loves them. If God can love them, we can love them. Love God, love people. <clears throat> right. I've been running in circles, jumping the hurdles. Getting caught in that rush, doing so much, I'm feeling kind of worn out. All this checking the boxes, trying to be flawless. Has me spinning in my head, catching my breath, too afraid to slow down. I tell myself to keep this up, that God wants more than just my love. I've been complicating things, it's just like me to overthink. Gotta keep it real simple, keep it real simple. Bring everything right back to ground zero. Cause it all comes down to this. Love God and love people. We're living in a world that keeps breaking. But if we want to find a way to change it, it all comes down to this. Love God and love people. Oh, this is freedom. The key 
peace to the kingdom. Knowing life will be found when love can be found. Because love is what it's all about. I tell myself to keep this up. That all God wants is just my love. No more complicating things. No more need to overthink. Gotta keep it real simple. Keep it real simple. Bring everything right back to ground zero. Cause it all comes down to this. Love God and love peace. Love is kind, rescues hearts and changes lives. Love is all we need to make things right. Gotta keep it real simple. Oh, it's really so simple. Oh, gotta keep it real simple. Keep it real simple. Bring everything right back to ground zero. Cause it all comes down. Love God and love people. We're living in a world that keeps breaking. But if we want to find a way to change it, it all comes down to this. Love God and love people. Keep on loving, keep on loving. Love God and love people. So keep on loving, keep on loving. Thank you, Praise Band. I really like that song. I've got another song about love. How about this one? Love, love, love. Dum, da, dum. Love, love, love. Dum, da, dum. All you need is love, love, love. Love is all you need. Ah, the Beatles have just preached today's sermon. Two weeks ago, we heard the call of God through Moses in our reading from the book of Deuteronomy, to love God, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments, and to do so for our own well-being. A reminder to notice the pronoun. Always notice pronouns in Scripture. Typically, they are always plural. Not to do so for my well-being, but for our well-being. I mentioned how Jewish tradition gives us 613 commandments in the law of the Lord. And ever since that law has come down from the top of Mount Sinai, we human beings have been striving and quibbling and wondering how best to keep the commandments. How best to keep the commandments in our own lives and in the lives as a community. What a wonderful question. Teacher. Which commandment is the greatest? Jesus said to the lawyer, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the entire law and the words of the prophet. As I mentioned in the introduction, Jesus isn't offering anything new here. He combines two verses from the Torah, Deuteronomy 6.5, which we heard the other week, and Leviticus 19.18. My guess is, as they were listening, the Pharisees nodded their heads in agreement with what Jesus said. Two Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' time said the same thing. Rabbi Halil said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to another. That is the whole law. The rest is all commentary. Rabbi Akiba said that Leviticus 19.18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is the greatest principle in the law. All religions include what is known 
as the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. That's certainly an expression of love. Although, allow me a tongue-in-cheek moment here for just a moment. If you put Christianity and Buddhism together, you may have a bit of trouble. Why? Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Buddhism says there is no self. So maybe we're off the hook for loving our neighbor. Hmm, maybe we are off the hook for loving our neighbor. I don't think so. We know that we should love our neighbor. We know that our enemy is also our neighbor, thanks to this passage in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus adds the tale of the Good Samaritan. We know that everyone is our neighbor. So why is it so hard, so difficult to love everyone? Why is it so difficult to love everyone? I am convinced that the answer has to do with sight, and not necessarily the sight of our eyeballs, but the sight with our minds and with our hearts, how we see with our minds and with our hearts. We humans have trouble seeing. We know this, which is probably why so much of Jesus' ministry that is given to us in the Gospels is about seeing. Restoring sight to the man born blind by mixing dust and saliva and then rubbing it on the man's eyes. There's also the story of Jesus on the road to Jericho where a certain blind man sitting by the roadside calls out, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. The man is scolded, ironically, and told to be quiet, but he shouts even louder. Jesus stops and calls for the man to be brought to him. When he was present, Jesus asks, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man says, Lord, I want to see. Jesus says to him, receive your sight, for your faith has healed you. At once, the man was able to see. Lord, I want to see. The Franciscan teacher Richard Rohr writes, it is our highest ethical calling to see. It is our highest ethical calling to see, to learn how to see better, to see more, to see deeper. Remember Jesus' words, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye? but do not notice the log in your own eye. I've spent the last week listening to a podcast from the Center for Action and Contemplation. It's titled, Learning How to See. The teacher, author, and preacher Brian McLaren in that podcast arrives at the conclusion that we cannot see because we are biased. Our brains have biases. We favor or disfavor one thing or another based on who we are as a people, living in certain ways, coming out of particular cultures and ways of being with particular backgrounds, particular ideologies, and also because of the way our brains are chemically and biologically wired. McLaren comes up with a list of 13 biases, unlucky 13, that prevent us from seeing as God would have us see. And in using sound pedagogical technique and in true preacher fashion, he begins each bias with the letter C. So prepare yourselves. A 13-point sermon is on its way. The first is confirmation bias probably one that we know and can all get our heads wrapped around. The human brain welcomes information that confirms what it already thinks and resists information that disturbs or contradicts what it already thinks. Confirmation bias. The second is complexity bias. We prefer a simple lie to a complex truth. 
community bias. It's easy for us to see what our community sees and very hard for us to see something which our community doesn't see or doesn't want to see. We prefer tribe over truth. Complementarity bias. If people are nice to you, you'll be open to what they see and what they have to say. If they aren't nice to you, you won't. Contact bias. What other people see who I don't have contact with, I do not see. Conservative liberal bias. Our brains like to see as our party sees, and we flock with those who see as we do. Consciousness bias, that depending on our level of consciousness or our level of maturity, different things will be easy for us to see, some things will be hard for us to see, and some things will be impossible for us to see. Competency bias, that we are incompetent to know how incompetent we are. Confidence bias is the tendency to believe people who speak confidently, no matter how much they're lying to us, and to doubt people who speak hesitantly, no matter how honest they are. Next is conspiracy bias, which is our desire to believe stories that cast us as either the hero or the victim. We never want to accept a story that casts us as the villain or as accomplices to the villain. And then there is comfort bias. Our brains welcome data that allows us to relax and be happy, and our brains reject data that require us to adjust work or that may inconvenience ourselves. We could say the brain is lazy, but the brain is very fast about being lazy. And there's catastrophe bias. Our brains are wired to set a baseline of normalcy and assume what feels normal has always been and always will be. And then finally, cash bias. Our brains are wired to see within the framework of our economy, and we see what helps us make money. It is very hard to see anything that inter interferes with our way of making a living. There they are, the quickest 13-point sermon you'll ever hear. The 13 biases, call them the 13 C's that prevent us from seeing. Oh, how tempting it is to start next week with a 13-part sermon series. Take us all the way to Christmas. But I'm not going there. I don't know about you, but I cannot help but feel condemned by some of these items on this list. Okay, I'm a little biased there. All of these items on this list in one way or another. And I'm so grateful for McLaren's work in helping me see what I previously did not see. When we're not seeing something, when love isn't happening, guess what's in the way? Call them the unlucky 13 C's, which get in our way of following the 613 C's or commandments. Our biases prevent our seeing and we do not see as God sees. Imagine having our biases removed and our sight restored. Would we then be able to see how God sees? Would we then be able to love every one of our neighbors? I would like to suggest that perhaps love of neighbor is love of God. And to see our neighbor is to see as God sees. Evagrius Ponticus, a fourth century desert father, argued that love of neighbor is love of God because it is love of the image of God since we're all created 
in the image of God. We can't help loving God by loving our neighbor. One of my favorite love stories comes out of the L'Arche community. For those of you not familiar with a L'Arche community, L'Arche was founded in France in 1964 by Father Jean Vanier when Jean welcomed two men with different abilities into his home. The Arch homes are now in over 150 cities on five continents. I close with the following story. Every Monday night, the whole community gathered for prayer and reflection. One night, Pat, the director of the community, asked, In our reading, the word love appears three times. Love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Can anyone tell me what love is? Pat asked. There was silence. Then Dovey, a core member, answered, Sure, love is when God holds you tight. Let's demonstrate, said Pat, standing up and opening his arms wide, ready to hug. Dovey got awkwardly to her feet, started forward, then stopped. Wait, she said, which one of us is God? Amen. Thank you for those challenging words. <clears throat> we come to our time of communion, and we will stand and Sing together hymn number 422, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. be found at this table. To the question for who is the greater, the one who serves or the one at the table, the world so often quickly says, why, the one at the table is the greater. Yet Jesus says, here I am among you as one who serves. Come, all are invited to this table of the Lord, for love is the host and the guest. Come, See that our Lord is good. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come, we thank you um, for this time that we've had together. Um, we thank you for bringing us together as one people. We pray that you bless these elements. 
Help us to see the world as you would have us see. Um, We know that even the greatest gift um, of love was you and sending your son. And even in that, Christ shared his love with those that he knew would betray him. So help us as we go about our days to show your love to others as you have instructed us and to help us to be your light among your peoples. And be with us now as we pray the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us... When love was betrayed, when love was denied, when love was deserted, Jesus took a loaf of bread and after blessing it, gave it to his disciples. Here is the bread of life. And then he took the cup and said, thank you to God and gave it to his disciples. Here is the cup of salvation. Truly I tell you, said Jesus, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new with you in the kingdom of heaven. All are welcome.
Scripture says, give as you are able in accord with how God has blessed you. For freely we have been given all that we have and all that we have. Knowing that life is more blessed to give than to receive, we receive the gifts from God of time, talent, treasure, and love, and rejoice in those same gifts given this week, today, and through next week. Let us pray. Giver of all good gifts, we are grateful for all our blessings and for this opportunity to show love of our neighbor by sharing a portion from our plenty. Help us to give with a happy heart, with a soul that recognizes the divine in all of whom we encounter, and with a mind that understands others as equals. In your son's name we pray, amen. I invite you all to stand and as we sing our closing hymn, Act Justly, Love Mercy, Walk Humbly. you to receive the benediction. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace and give you
I bet the drive back to Wisconsin was probably six, seven, yeah, it was insane. <laughs> Hey, you could...